Fund Supermart, your online gateway to unit trusts. Hi, Veronica. Good morning. The Lion Global Asian Bond Fund has had quite an impressive track record since its inception. And on a year-to-date basis, what were the main drivers of the fund's performance in 2015? The returns for the funds uh, are derived from the coupon carry from each underlying bond in the portfolio. The appreciation of the US dollar against Sing dollar is another major contributor. The fund is uh, actively managed uh, with duration positioning and credit selection. The markets have been anticipating a Fed lift off in September, and in view of that, the fund had been positioned in short dated uh, corporate papers. Uh, to minimise the sensitivity of the bond prices to rising interest rates. For credit selection, uh, the focus on credit selection had helped uh, in fund performance. We had focus on companies with good quality earnings, credible track record and uh, well-established companies. We noticed that a large proportion of the fund's portfolio is allocated to issues unweighted by major credit rating agencies. Are there any risks that investors should be aware of? Does your credit investment approach have any safeguards to mitigate this risk? Some examples of unrated names include Capitaland and Capitaland in Singapore, and uh, Wheelock and uh, New World uh, in Hong Kong. These names are household names. Another big sector within the dollar Asia bond universe that tends to be unrated is Philippine corporates. Example, bonds issued by San Miguel Group, there is a pool of investors in Philippines with surplus US dollars to buy bonds issued by Philippine corporates with or without credit ratings. The reason why some companies skip the additional step of obtaining credit ratings from rating agencies such as S&P, Moody's and Fitch is mostly due to cost savings and time considerations. These household names have a sufficient pool of investors who are familiar with them and are prepared to buy the bonds even without credit ratings. In fact, this attests to the good credit standing amongst investors. In most cases, the lack of an explicit credit rating does not equate to a weaker financial profile. Some investment mandates do require explicit ratings. This means that the pool of investors able to buy unrated papers is a subset of the bigger universe. For the fund, this provides a profit opportunity. Oftentimes, there is a slight pickup in yields to compensate investors for a smaller investor pool and the lack of an external rating. Where bonds are unrated, the firm applies an internal rating methodology to derive a rating that is used internally. The firm's internal rating scale can be mapped to those uh, established by external rating agencies. Will US rate hike have any implications for Asian credit? A rising interest rate environment in general has negative impact on bond prices. The price uh, erosion is offset to some extent by firstly, coupon carry on the underlying bond and secondly, uh, potential capital gains from credit spread tightening. The extent of this offset will depend on how fast interest rates move higher. The impact is manageable if interest rates move up gradually, which is our base case. Say, if the Fed moves in December 2015, or in first quarter 2016, or further down the road 2016, 2017, what is more important is the Fed's guidance on the path for further policy rate hikes. We are expecting the Fed to remain dovish in their rhetoric uh, with language emphasising data dependent and a gradual approach in normalisation of interest rates. As such, we expect the impact on Asian credit markets to be benign. Asia's high yield bond space has been dominated by issues from Chinese property developers. How much exposure does the fund have to this sector? And what are your thoughts on the credit fundamentals of Chinese property developers? Chinese property players had tapped the offshore Asia credit markets actively between 2011 to 2014. Things have changed in 2015. In 2015, Chinese regulations were revised to allow property companies to tap off onshore bonds uh, within China. The Chinese property companies can issue onshore bonds firstly 
at meaningfully cheaper funding costs and secondly, in Chinese Yuan. This means that the borrowers are not subject to the volatility in the dollar-yuan FX movements. As a result, offshore US dollar-denominated uh, markets have become much less appealing to Chinese uh, borrowers. The new issue pipeline for Chinese property issuers is virtually zero. So with the scarcity of new bond supply in primary markets and low dealer's inventory in the secondary markets, the market um, technicals for Chinese property is very strong. Every new bid just pushed the bond price higher. On that, uh, the fund will maintain or even increase the exposure it has in Chinese property sector. This strategy is further supported by the macro and credit fundamentals of this sector. At the macro level, real estate sector is traditionally a beneficiary of monetary easing in China. At the credit fundamental level, it is typically the bigger companies that are able to tap the offshore market. Hence, our comfort with an overweight position in this segment. What is your outlook on the various countries and sectors within Asia for the next two to three years? We remain constructive on Asia in the next two to three years. Concerns around China include stock market bubble, currency adjustment, slower GDP growth, all have subsided uh, for the time being. Bond valuations have become more reasonable compared to the start of the year. We like corporate bonds over sovereign and quasi-sovereign bonds, given the additional yield pickup, which would cushion the price impact from a rising interest rate environment. Uh, we like Chinese property bonds, given supportive market technicals, arising from low dealers' inventory and uh, scarce new supply in the primary markets. Other preferred sectors include selectively uh, some Chinese investment grade corporates and financials. However, within the China financials, we are cautious on asset management companies and securities brokers, notwithstanding the additional pickup over the big Chinese banks. The Indonesian quasi sovereign and corporates are undervalued after a sharp sell off in third quarter and has lagged the market in a recent rally, we would time it for a small technical rebound. Over the next few quarters, uh, we continue to underweight oil majors and oil service names and mining and commodity sectors.